So today is about science communication. And the person that we're bringing up, I first saw him speak on the news during the time the Curiosity Letters started going on. I'd been reading his blog for some time beforehand. But when one of the persons said, you know, why are we doing this? Just seeming one out the top of his head, he gave this wonderful explanation for why science and discovery matters that you think he would have been rehearsing for a week. And I said, we need to get that back down here. I would like to introduce blogger of uh, Starts With a Bang, astrophysicist, and really awesome Halloween costumer. Trust me, you'll see his pictures on his website. You'll never think that some guy could do Zandy from Street Fighter 2 and Rainbow Dash with the same amount of justice. Let's have a hearing for Dr. Ethan Siegel. All right, thank you, Alan, and thank you. Thank you to the CFI, to Rihanna, to Jeanette, and to everyone here um, for some amazing uh, hospitality and also for having me here. I'm really excited to speak to you today. Um, and one of the things that I, I'd love to sort of talk about before we go ahead and get started is, uh, you know, before we get started with my talk on beginning, middle, and end, how our knowledge of the universe has changed since Carl Sagan's original 1980 Cosmos, is I'd like you to sort of think back to what, what Cosmos is all about, what science is all about, and what learning about the universe is really all about. It isn't about what one person knows. It isn't about turning Carl Sagan into a celebrity. It's about what we know. It's about how we know it. It's about gaining this awareness and this appreciation for a story that we all share. I think that if Carl Sagan were alive today, he would love this story more than anything. At the end of the day, even though this is about Carl Sagan Day and about Carl Sagan, I think his greatest legacy is really about furthering everyone's knowledge of the universe and our ability to share it and what it is that we all know. And I, would, I am delighted to get to bring a little bit of that to you today. So when we talk about what we knew in 1980 versus what we know now in 2014, there are three parts that I like to think of. There are three ways that I like to break this down. As best as Carl Sagan knew in 1980, the beginning of the universe, what the universe is today, and what the end of the universe, or the eventual fate of the universe would look like, those were, those were tremendous questions that for the first time, really in the 20th century, we started to gain answers to. But what we're looking at today, what we're looking at today in 2014, all those answers that we thought we knew in 1980, they've all improved. And they're gonna to continue to improve into the future. And that's what I'm excited to tell you about today. So let's start back in 1980, all right? Things had come really far in 1980. We were aware that the universe we have today, full of planets, stars, galaxies, and giant clusters of galaxies spanning billions of light years in size, we were aware that the universe was not always like this. We were aware that it was expanding today. And that in the past, as we go back in time, things were smaller, denser, hotter, and less evolved. That the stars that exist today were, they came about from the corpses of stars that had existed previously. The galaxies that existed today came about from mergers of previous generations of galaxies. And we can extrapolate this backwards and backwards in time to when there were fewer heavy elements and heavy atoms in the universe because there were fewer generations of stars. We can extrapolate backwards to when things were so hot that we couldn't even form neutral atoms or even complicated atomic nuclei. And we can go back further and further and further to what we then consider to be the moment of the Big Bang. 
That was Carl Sagan's universe in 1980, and the story of how we went from the very beginning to our universe today was really what Cosmos was all about. It's the story of where everything came from and how it got to be the way it is today. <laughs> what did we know scientifically that led us to that point? What were the things that we had discovered about the universe that led us to this conclusion? Because scientifically, it's not enough to just tell a story. We have to have reason behind every step in that story that's compelling, that's incontrovertible, that's validated. There were four major things that we had observed. The four major cornerstones of cosmology, of the study of the cosmos, were the expanding universe was one, Two was the formation of large-scale structures, not just stars and solar systems, but of galaxies, of clusters of galaxies, and of the giant cosmic web on the largest scales. We needed the presence of the elements in the periodic table. If the universe came from a very hot, very dense state, it couldn't have started with these heavy nuclei. Things would have broken apart immediately under those tremendous temperatures and under those very high energies. So we had to form them somehow. And finally, there was the existence of the cosmic microwave background. That is the leftover glow from the Big Bang. If the Big Bang weren't right, we wouldn't have any reason to expect this to exist. And yet, its discovery was maybe the single strongest, most incontrovertible piece of evidence for this picture we started to lay out for you. So when we talk about the expanding universe, what is it that led us to discover the universe is expanding? The thing is now, where we are, we can look up at the galaxies in the night sky, the giant spirals, the ellipticals, the irregulars, the rings, the different types of galaxies out there. For every galaxy, we can measure how far away it is from us just by looking at its light. The same way you can look at a light bulb, and if it's a 60 watt light bulb or a 100 watt light bulb, you know how bright it is intrinsically. So if you can measure what the brightness <laughs> is that you see, you can figure out how far away it is. We can use that same principle with galaxies. We can say, looking at a galaxy in the night sky, if I know intrinsically either how bright the galaxy is or how bright some part or property of that galaxy is intrinsically, and then I go and measure it, and I say, what do I see? That comparison, the what I see versus what I know it is, I can figure out right away how far away it has to be. And then, the combined with that, I can look at how fast is it moving away from us. That's only a little more complicated. To figure out how fast a galaxy is moving away from us, all I have to do, this came up terrible, I apologize. Um, all I have to do is remember that every atom and every molecule in the universe has different energy levels that its electrons transition between. So if I light it up, if I give it energy, it will emit light at a characteristic set of wavelengths. It looks beautiful on my computer screen, I promise. It will emit light at a characteristic set of wavelengths. If I shine light from behind it, it's going to absorb light at a characteristic set of wavelengths. But because the universe is expanding, the wavelengths of light stretch as the universe expands. So what I should see is if a galaxy is moving away from us, that light is going to be redshifted from its original wavelength. And the amount that it shifted tells me the amount that either it's moving away from us or the universe has expanded since that light was emitted. 
And that's how we know from that combination of looking at objects that are farther and farther and farther away from us and seeing that the light from them gets redshifted more and more and more the farther away it is. That's what told us that the universe had to be expanding. That was one cornerstone. The second was what we call the large-scale structure of the universe. If we started with a uniform universe with just slightly over-dense or under-dense regions to it, and then we say, okay, gravity, the universe is expanding, but you get to do your thing. When we scale the expansion out, because watching a million particles disappear off your screen isn't very interesting. So if we make our camera expand along with the universe and just follow what do the galaxies in it do, we find that they merge together and swarm together in clusters, in groups, in isolation, with great voids between them. And that matches the universe we see today. So we need something like that to create the structure that we see today. That's a second quarter so. Third one, what about the elements in the universe? Well, if we can collapse to form stars, that's great. They can fuse heavier elements. But then those elements have to get back out into the interstellar medium to form the next generation of stars. Good thing for us, the most massive stars in the universe, the ones that produce the greatest number of heavy elements, also live the shortest amount of time. So a star like our sun might live 12 billion years before it runs out of fuel and dies, but a star 10 times as massive as our sun doesn't live one-tenth the amount of time, it lives one one-thousandth the amount of time. So a star that's much more massive than our sun lives much less, uh, a much less, I must be known that, it lives a shorter amount of time. It lives a shorter amount of time, and that means it only takes a very small amount of time to get heavy elements in the universe. Where you have more stars, a greater density of stars, you wind up with heavier elements faster. So we see more heavy elements at the center of our galaxy than we do at the outskirts. And that's the story of where the heavy elements came from. So when Carl Sagan said famously, we are star stuff, what that means is except for hydrogen, right, because there's no helium in our bodies, except for hydrogen, all the other elements that make up every molecule in your body were formed inside a star at some point in the past history of the universe. And that's where all the elements, except for hydrogen and helium, and a tiny, tiny percent of lithium comes from. And finally, there's the cosmic microwave background. Remember, if the universe was hot and dense in the past, then what was happening is you had things like protons and electrons and photons, particles of light, smacking into each other all the time at very high energies. And what happens if you have a high energy photon collide with an atom, right? Collide with a proton with an electron orbiting it. If it collides and hits the electron with enough energy, it's going to kick the electron right out of the atom. And that means rather than getting solid, liquid, or gas as your phases of matter, you're going to get a plasma. And so the universe was ionized, but it was also expanding and cooling. And at some point, you reach a transition where these wavelengths of your photons stretch. And that means they go to lower energies over time. That's a great thing about the expanding universe, is that high energy light, as the universe stretches, as space expands, the wavelength of your light gets longer and the energy of your radiation gets lower. 
So even though you always have protons and electrons finding each other and forming atoms, they get kicked out at early times. They're not stable as neutral atoms. But finally, you reach a point where the universe has cooled enough only about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Remember, our universe is billions of years old today. But when that happens, you can form neutral atoms, and all of this leftover radiation should just stream and expand and lose energy as the universe grows. So what we should see when we look up today is this leftover background of light that's at these incredibly low energies. Not visible light like we expect, not the ultraviolet light that can ionize um, atoms, but rather lower energies, not even infrared energies, but all the way today in the microwave range. And it was in the 1960s that this antenna, sensitive to microwaves, is actually built to detect microwave radiation being bounced off of balloons for military purposes. But they couldn't find it because everywhere they looked, they kept getting this extra noise that wasn't coming from the galaxy, that wasn't coming from stars, that wasn't coming from the atmosphere, and they could not figure it out until they talked with a team of cosmologists who told them about the cosmic microwave background. And that was what they found. So in the 1980s, this was the universe. The universe is expanding and cooling today. Why? Because it was hotter and denser in the past. So when we look back, when we look light years and thousands of light years and billions of light years away, we're also looking back in time. And that's what we have. We start today, and as we look back in time, we see galaxies as they were when they were younger. When we look back even farther, we see places where there's still neutral intergalactic dust because it hasn't been around long enough for the ultraviolet light from galaxies and stars to ionize it. When we look even farther back, we see evidence of that cosmic microwave background from where the universe became full of neutral atoms for the first time. And if we could look back arbitrarily far, all the way back to the very beginning, that would be the Big Bang. So this theory that we had, this is the Big Bang. And it had been known and accepted and established for about 15 years as this is the only thing that explains those four cornerstones of what we observed when Carl Sagan made Cosmos. But it is not 1980 anymore. So to recap, the universe started out as a hot, dense state where all the different amounts of matter, all the different clumps that would become galaxies were close together, and over time, the universe, the very fabric of space itself, expanded. So that all the galaxies and groups of galaxies and clusters of galaxies that weren't bound together are farther apart today than they were in the past because of the expanding universe. But if we go very far back in time, the universe was much smaller, all the way back, arbitrarily far, to when it was no more than as small as you want it to be. The elements and the ingredients for life in the universe today came from the corpses of the previous generations of stars that lived and died and put those heavy elements back into the universe. Over many generations, those heavy elements accumulated so that when new stars formed, they would be born with not just a star or a pair of stars in them, but with protoplanetary disks 
full of heavy elements where rocky planets and gas giant planets could form as well. And we knew that that is where the heavy elements came from, that is where the planets came from, and that is where the ingredients for life came from. We also knew, based on where things had come from, based on the Big Bang, that there were three possible fates for this universe. And let me think about them for a moment. Imagine you've got something that starts out very similar to a Big Bang. Two things are going on. One is it's full of matter and energy. So there's a tremendous amount of gravitational force working to pull it together. But it doesn't start off stationary. It starts off expanding at some very rapid rate. What's going to happen? There are three things that can happen. One is you can imagine this case over here, what ends in a big crunch. The universe starts off expanding. It starts off cooling. But there's a tremendous amount of gravitation from all of the things in the universe. And it's working to slow that expansion down, to reverse it, and to relapse it. And it wins. That the gravity of all the matter and energy in the universe is too much for the expansion that we start with. And it reaches a maximum size and reverses and relaxes. And that is a big crunch. That was one possible fate of the universe. There was the opposite case over on this side, the big chill or the big freeze, where the exact same battle is happening, but the opposite side wins. The expansion is too much for gravity. Gravity can't overcome it, gravity can't stop it, and the expansion rate drops but never reaches zero. And things expand away forever and ever, and the universe is a cold, lonely place the farther and farther we go forward in time. Or, just like Goldilocks and Three Bears, maybe the porridge isn't too hot or too cold. Maybe it's just right. Maybe we're right on the border between those two cases. Maybe if we had one more atom in the universe, it would re-collapse. But we don't have that one more atom. So what happens is the expansion rate drops and asymptotes to zero. And, it, and the expansion size sort of reaches some maximum size, but never recollapses. That we just coast. That's what we call a critical universe. And that can cause savings time. This case was what the observations favored, but we didn't know for sure which of these possibilities was the right one. And that's what we had in 1980. So how have these advanced? since then. How has our understanding of the beginning, where we extrapolate back to a hot, dense, expanding state, full of matter and radiation of some arbitrarily high density, how has that changed? How has our understanding of today, where we have a universe full of heavy elements, of all the atoms and all the ingredients for life, how has that changed? And finally, how has our understanding of the end, where the universe has grown and expanded up to a certain point, but will it continue expanding forever? Will it re-collapse? Will it do something in between? How has that changed? Well, all three of these have changed. The beginning is kind of interesting, because you run into some problems if you decide to go all the way back to what we call a singularity, if you come all the way back to an arbitrary density, arbitrarily hot state, arbitrarily energetic state, well, physics does some strange things that we may not like. It produces all sorts of very high energy unstable particles that should leave things behind that we don't see in our universe. It also produces a few puzzles that we might not realize at first glance, but let's think about some of these. Okay? The universe was in a hotter, denser, more rapidly expanding state, but could this have gone arbitrarily far back this way? Could we have gone back to an arbitrarily high density, arbitrarily high energies, 
And with that bring up problems. Well, one problem is what we call the flat universe. I told you that we had those three possibilities between a universe that expands and re-collapses, one that expands too quickly and everything disappears forever, or one that's right on the border. Well, if we had one that re-collapses, that corresponds to a positively curved universe, or one that you see at the top. If we expand forever, that would correspond to a negatively curved universe, one that's shaped like the surface of a saddle that curves up in one dimension and down in the other. If I were to draw a triangle on the surface of a saddle, I would find that the angles add up to less than 180 degrees. If I were to draw them on the surface of a sphere, I would find they add up to more than 180 degrees. But the universe we see turns out to be flat. Like, really, really, really flat. And that's a problem. You might not realize that's a problem, but what that means is the rate of expansion initially and the amount of matter and energy in the universe initially had to match up so arbitrarily well that it's really crazy. How well did they have to work, watch out and match up? Well, let's just show you. So, one nanosecond after the Big Bang, based on what the expansion rate of the universe is, I want you to see that these numbers match up for 24 decimal places. And then in the 25th, they can differ by 0.2 grams per cubic centimeter in density, in energy density. If it differed by that much, with a number that big, a universe would be re-collapsing by now if it had that much extra density. A universe that was that much less in density would be t almost twice the size of the universe we see today. So when we say the universe is flat, this is a puzzle. Why were the density and the expansion rate balanced so perfectly? They certainly didn't have to be. It seems arbitrary. That's the flatness problem. There's another problem, and that's a problem of the universe being of a perfectly uniform temperature. Yes, the cosmic microwave background should be roughly uniform, but perfectly uniform is a surprise. I want you to think about what happens in a room like this. Right? If I have, if I decide it's cold in here, and I turn off the air conditioner, and I put a space heater in one corner of the room, are the people on that side of the room going to feel it right away? Are the people closer to it going to have the same experience as the people far away from it? The answer is no. <laughs> Not unless all of the air molecules heated up on that one side of the room have an opportunity to share their energy with every other place in the room. The universe is like this too. If I look all the way in one direction in the sky, and then all the way in the completely opposite direction in the sky, those two regions of space are separated by a greater distance than light could have traveled since the Big Bang. It would be impossible for them to have exchanged information or shared energy with one another. So then why are they all the same temperature if they haven't had a chance to collide with each other, if they haven't had a chance to exchange information or energy with each other? We can imagine, sure, if things are roughly the same, they should be roughly the same temperature, but exactly the same temperature seems strange. So that's the temperature problem, or sometimes called the horizon problem. And there's a third problem as well, the one I talked about earlier. If we go back to arbitrarily high energies, we should start to see new particles, not just the ones that we create in particle accelerators, like the one at the Large Hadron Collider, but ones at far higher energies. We can extrapolate back to much, much, much higher energies 
in the Big Bang than the ones we create here. And there are some strange things that should come out of that. One are super heavy bosons, or particles that should allow the proton to decay, but the proton doesn't decay at least not with a lifetime of less than 10 to the 34 years at last count. It should give us magnetic monopoles, just like we have things with a positive electric charge or a negative electric charge. But we can't have a north and south pole magnet that exists without the other. We should have those in the universe if it had reached those super high energies. So where are they? Well, we've looked for them, and these are the bounds that we see. They don't exist. We don't see them. So why not? So we have some problems. And these were problems that didn't make it into cosmos, but they were known. These were puzzles. But the solution to this, to all three of these problems, is the same solution. What if the Big Bang, going all the way back to this hot, dense, expanding state, what if that, in fact, wasn't the very beginning? What if there was something that happened prior to, we could say, we had a hot, dense, expanding matter and radiation-filled universe that set the whole thing up? What would that look like? Well, there was an idea that came out right around the time Cosmos was airing by Alan Booth at MIT, who said, I have this idea, cosmic inflation. And let me tell you what it does. Instead of the universe expanding and the expansion rate slowing down because of all of the matter and radiation and energy whose gravity works to slow that expansion rate down, what if instead the very fabric of the universe was expanding at what we call an exponential rate? Think about what exponential means for a moment. It means that if I have a universe of a certain amount of size, and I wait a little bit of time, it's going to double in size. It's going to double in size in every direction. So it's going to be double the length, and double the width, and double the depth. So it's going to be eight times its original size. And then if I wait that same amount of time that it took for the universe to double, what's it going to do if I wait that amount of time again? It's going to double again. So what's double the thing that was double the length and double the width and double the depth? Well, that was going to be four times the length and four times the width and four times the depth, or 64 times the volume. And I can wait again the same amount of time that it took to double. And now it's going to be eight times the original length, eight times the original width, and eight times the original depth. These numbers get big, fast. At the rate the universe was expanding very early on, it would have taken only about 10 to the minus 30 seconds for the universe, for what we perceive as the universe, to go from being what we call the Planck size, that is the smallest unit of length that makes sense with the laws of quantum physics. It is a length that is 10 to the minus 35 meters. Okay, so a proton, the size of a proton is 10 to the minus 15 meters. The size of an atom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. The size of a human being is about 10 to the zero meters. So if you take the difference between an atom and a human being, and then you take that difference again down another scale to a, a size. So whatever a human is compared to an atom, an atom compared to that same scale, and then that same scale compared to an even smaller scale, and then go about halfway again. That's the Planck scale. In 10 to the minus 30 seconds, 
Okay, that's a crazy small amount of time. That will take that scale and make it larger than the entire size of the observable universe today. So that's what inflation hypothesizes. And you say, that is a wild hypothesis. You better have some crazy evidence for that. And you're right, but we do. So what are the things that happen? Well, if your universe is inflating like that, pick any tiny small space on any sort of surface, whether it's a sphere or a saddle or anything else your mind can concoct. And imagine that it's inflated and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It gets bigger super fast. So that now, when you look at how big this is, it is indistinguishable from flat, regardless of how it started. Think about what else that means. Think about what happens if you've got a huge, wild variety of initial conditions. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I had a different picture there. <laughs> Think about what happens if you have a huge, wild variety of initial conditions. Think about if one part of this is hot and one part is cold and one part is in the middle. If you take that tiny region where, sure, maybe a tiny part of it is the same temperature and you grow it to a tremendous size, that will stretch the same temperature and the same properties everywhere across the universe. So what will you wind up with? You will wind up with at least a part of the universe that looks to be the same temperature I mean, everywhere. And even if you had high energy stuff at one point, as long as your universe doesn't heat back up to that same temperature, you won't expect it to create any new magnetic monopoles or other high energy relics. So we can solve all those problems, which is amazing. But in order to be scientifically robust, in order to be valid, in order for us to consider it, we say, well, that's all great that you can explain these things we've already seen. Tell me what's new. Make a new prediction for me. Tell me what I haven't seen yet so I can go look for it, and then I'll tell you if you're right or wrong. And that's good. We want to be skeptical. And even though these three things that inflation claimed to do were known to Carl Sagan when he was making Cosmos, because the preprint of that paper by Alan Booth at MIT first was submitted in 1979, it wasn't proven, so it didn't deserve to make it into Cosmos, and that's justified. But there's a new thing that it predicts. What does it predict? It predicts a spectrum of scale invariant fluctuations. Remember I said that cosmic microwave background, that leftover glow from the Big Bang, was totally uniform. It's because we haven't been able to detect fluctuations. When we discovered it, we said it's three degrees Kelvin. It's three Kelvins above absolute zero. That's its temperature. And then we said it's 2.7 Kelvins. And then we said it's 2.73 Kelvin. And then we said it's 2.725 Kelvin. And we get more and more and more accurate, but we started to see the same temperature everywhere. It wasn't until we got down to micro-Kelvin measurements that we started to see imperfections. And that didn't happen until we already had the chance to say, hey, inflation, predict for me. What should those imperfections look like? And inflation said, have I got a story for you. Imagine that we've got this inflationary state before the universe can be described by hot, dense, and expanding. Imagine it. So what happens? Remember, space, even empty space, isn't all that empty. We still live in a quantum universe that has quantum fluctuations at the very smallest scales, inherent variations in the amount of energy in space at any given point, at any given time. You may have heard of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. That is why Heisenberg, when he got stopped by the cops for speeding, the officer says to him, Heisenberg, 
do you know how fast you were going? And he said, no, but I know exactly where I am. It's because there is this inherent uncertainty between position and momentum. You cannot measure them both at the same time. And the better you measure one, inherently the less well you know the other. Well, there is that same uncertainty as there is between position and momentum, between energy and time. So if you are looking at a region of space and you want to know how much energy is in this amount of space, the shorter a time scale you look on, the greater the uncertainty is in your energy there. So if we're talking about time scales during inflation of 10 to the minus 30 something seconds, we have these big fluctuations in energy that happen on those scales. If we're talking about very small distances, we get very big fluctuations that happen on that scale. And that's why if we go down to a very small quantum level, we're going to get these very large energy fluctuations. And if the universe is inflating, they will get stretched across the universe. And that's what we're going to see, is what shows up today as large-scale structure, and what shows up today as temperature fluctuations, which are the seeds that will grow into large-scale structure, if you remember from our earlier video. We should see they exist in a certain type of spectrum called a scale invariant spectrum. We should see fluctuations of a very specific magnitude that is constant across scales until we look at scales small enough that gravity can begin collapsing them. And then we should see a rise and a peak and a fall and a series of other peaks. And that's what inflation predicted we ought to see. And it predicted that in the early 1980s. And in 1992, we finally measured these fluctuations. The COBE satellite, we had to launch a satellite into space to measure the microwave region of the spectrum. And these were the first results from the COBE satellite where they found, for the first time, this spectrum of fluctuations. How did it compare to inflation's predictions? Well, pretty good. We saw this nice, even spectrum of fluctuations that then rose and oscillated in those peaks we talked about. And that was the smoking gun that we're looking for, that incontrovertible piece of evidence, that extra prediction that we can confirm that says the universe began with an inflationary state before the Big Bang. So that's the beginning. That's how the beginning of the universe has changed since 1980, since Carl Sagan's cosmos. What about today? Well, to Carl Sagan, he knew that the atomic ingredients for life are everywhere. And he assumed that organic molecules would be everywhere. He talked about the Miller and Urey experiment and how you can take organic atoms, right? Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, silicon, um, copper, iron, that you can take these elements that we think are essential to life. You can expose them to energy and you can get organic molecules out of them. This is a multi-wavelength map of the center of the Milky Way galaxy. The galactic center, the true center, as you might have guessed, is right here. It's this really, really bright spot. So the ingredients for life, we know those molecules are everywhere. We didn't need life to make them. We look in interstellar space. We see sugars. We see amino acids. We see ethyl forming, which is the, act, the molecule responsible for the smell of raspberries. And we see polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, for all the chemists in the audience, which are carbon rings that are precursors to many of the complicated organic molecules that are essential to our life processes. Interesting fun fact, when we look at asteroids, 
ones that have landed on Earth and become meteorites, we actually find amino acids in there. Not only the 20 that we use in life processes here on Earth, but about 80 others. So we are suspicious that not only could life have arisen somewhere in the universe the way it arose here, but it could have arisen in completely different ways. That there are other ingredients that could have transformed into life processes as well elsewhere in the universe. We knew for sure back in the time of Carl Sagan and long before that life did occur here on Earth. But what about elsewhere in the universe? When you watch Cosmos, you hear Carl Sagan talk about Mars, to talk about Titan, to talk about Saturn's moons, to talk about Jupiter's moons. He doesn't talk about any worlds beyond our solar system, and there's a good reason for that. He didn't know of any. We hadn't known of any. But that is something that's changed and has the potential to change even further. So that's, now let me talk about where we stand today. So there are prospects for life elsewhere. Elsewhere, not just being on Mars, but on being around planets orbiting other stars. Right? Carl Sagan didn't know about that. He didn't have any planets that orbited other stars. That didn't come about until the 90s. In the 90s, they discovered it, right? There are planets out there orbiting other stars. There are a few main ways we detect them, but my favorite, the most common way we detect it, is by what's called the transit method. And I want you to imagine, here we are on Earth, looking at a star in the sky. What's going to happen when a planet passes it in its orbit? It's going to temporarily block some of the light from it. It's going to temporarily transit in front of that star, and when it does, a tiny fraction of that star's light will disappear and it'll dim. And then when that planet moves off of the limb of the sun, it will brighten again. So what we can do is we can say there are planets around other stars. I should have maybe brought that text up earlier. So there are planets around, not only sun-like stars, but stars that are more massive and stars that are less massive. We find them preferentially closer to the star. Why? Because those orbits are faster. If you're watching a star like our sun, and you only watch it for 100 days, you're going to catch Mercury transiting it if you're lined up right, because Mercury makes an orbit once every 88 days. You'd have to wait longer to catch Venus, and you'd have to wait a really long time to catch something like one of the gas giants. But that's what we've been doing. We've been watching these star systems for years now. And not only one orbit, but many orbits make it easier to detect these planets. The thing is, when we're watching planets around sun-like stars, or any type of star, we're greedy. We don't want to just detect planets. We want to detect planets that are a certain distance away from their parent star. Why? Because the closer you are to a star, the more energy from that star you receive. And the farther away you are, the less energy you receive and the cooler you'll be. We want you to be at the exact right temperature so you can have liquid water. That seems to be something really conducive to the formation and thriving of life. So we call these places around each star a habitable zone. We want to find not only planets, and not only planets around sun-like stars, but we want to find planets around sun-like stars that are in their stars' habitable zones. And we can, and we have, and we've confirmed some of them too. So just like Earth, we know, is in the star's habitable zone, in our star's planet habitable zone, we have found planets, including at least one rocky planet in its star's habitable zone, where it is possible, if the atmospheric conditions are right, that it does have liquid water. 
and it does have the ingredients for life, and it is even a rocky world. That would be amazing. So where do we want to look? It's this whitish region right here. That's the habitable zone. If you're too close, it's too hot, can't have life. If you're too cold, in the blue zone here, there needs to be another source of heat. We don't think you can have life. Because we can't have liquid water. Although, to be fair, it could happen in ways very different than it happened here on Earth. As you can see, we've preferentially found more planets that are closer to their parent stars. Because they're easier to find that way. But, we've also started to find planets that do fall in their star's habitable zones. And that's amazing. That would definitely have been cosmos-worthy had we known that in 1980. Here, as of September, the last time that they updated this catalog, there are 1,826 confirmed exoplanets that we have found, confirmed planets around other stars. Of those, there are 108 that are Earth mass, between half the mass of the Earth and twice the mass of the Earth. There are what we call either super-Earths or mini-Neptunes. There are more of those. There are Neptunians. These are between 10 and 50 Earth mass planets. And there are also the Jovians, or planets that are Jupiter mass in size. Right? And there are even a few smaller ones, some Mars-sized objects, or even some, you know, Pluto-sized objects. But this is, this is where the sweet spot is. This is where you have an Earth-mass planet in the habitable zone around a sun-like star. And not only do we have one that's confirmed, but if we include planetary candidates, and a planetary candidate, by the way, means something that we've discovered, but that hasn't been confirmed by more than one method yet, we have seven of them, and a total of more than 4,000 candidate planets. We would love to take the next step. The next step would be, just like we found the smoking gun of what happened before the Big Bang, we would love to find a smoking gun of life on another world. And the way we're going to do that first is by looking at an Earth-like planet and saying, if I were looking at an Earth-like planet that had actual life on it, so not just something in the habitable zone, not just something that was a rocky world orbiting a sun-like star at the right temperature, but something that actually had life. What would it look like? What signature would it have? Well, here on Earth, and you may recognize this little animation, those of you who've seen the original cosmos, whether we had single-celled life forms, or whether we had complex life forms, or whether things had evolved so that we had not just aquatic but land-based life forms, or even all the way up to sentient life forms, there would be one thing that would have been consistently affected, and that would be the planet's atmosphere. When we see a planet transit in front of the star, we not only have the disk of the world blocking the light from the star, but we have the light from the star shining through a ring of atmosphere. What happens when you shine light through atoms and molecules? Remember, they absorb light of very particular wavelengths. We have signatures of things like titanium dioxide. Not organic, but we've seen that. We have discovered water on planets that are orbiting stars through this method. We have not discovered water on a planet smaller than about Neptune-sized orbiting a star. Okay, because we need better telescopes to do that. 
But if we were looking at an Earth-like planet that had life on it, it would have a characteristic spectrum. It would have a characteristic atmospheric signature that would be a smoking gun of life. For Earth in particular, what would that be? We would see absorption lines for oxygen, for ozone, for carbon dioxide, and for water, along with uh, N2O, along with nitrous oxide. These are some of the elements, I'm sorry, some of the molecules that are present in Earth's atmosphere that in combination with one another tell us this could only have arisen through life processes. When we can do what's called atmospheric spectroscopy on Earth-like planets in the habitable zones around other stars, and by the way, if we chose to invest in it for about one or two billion dollars, we can build this and launch this right now with modern technology. We can find this. We could look at hundreds of candidate planets and say, do any of these first candidates have life? That is something that's going to happen, I'm pretty confident, within our lifetime. It's a very exciting time. So that's how today is different. And finally, what about the very end? of the universe. How is that different? Remember, we've got this eternal struggle between the expansion of the universe, trying to make everything race away from one another, and gravitation, which is trying to cause everything to re-collapse. There were three possibilities we thought of. The big crunch, where gravity wins, the expansion stops, the universe turns around and re-collapses. Ends in a crunch. Or, the opposite thing, the big freeze, the big trill, the big chill, where expansion wins, it continues forever, and it slows down sometimes to gravity, but it never reaches zero. Or, there's that Goldilocks option, that critical option, that right in the middle option, where it's right on the border between the two cases, and the expansion rate asymptotes to zero, but never turns around. That's what we thought was going to happen. Well, back when we were making these measurements in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, what were we seeing? Well, as you looked farther and farther and farther away at these dimmer and dimmer and dimmer objects, right? You were finally moving away faster and faster and faster. It looked very much like a critical universe. And when we plotted it out, it was all very consistent. The universe was expanding no matter where we looked at exactly a very predictable rate. But something bizarre started to happen as we looked farther and farther and farther away. The universe was surprising us. It looked for a while, when you look out to a certain distance or a certain speed, that we lived in a critical universe that was going out for billions of light years. But as we looked farther away, to tens of billions of light years, we started to see something surprising. This black curve here would have been what we expected for a universe that was really a critical universe that had matter and energy, matter and radiation exactly balancing the expansion. What we found is it's following this purple curve, which is not full of matter and radiation balancing expansion. It instead was something else. The expansion appears to balance exactly and then speed up. In other words, the expansion rate appeared to not be doing any of these three cases that we talked about earlier. It was not going to do a big crunch. It was not going to do a big chill or a big freeze. And it was not the critical case. It was this fourth option that we didn't consider where it looked like it was doing the critical case for a while and then all of a sudden the expansion rate sped up 
and things started being driven apart farther and faster than we ever would have expected. The universe wasn't just expanding, it was accelerating, and this was a big surprise. What's the explanation? Well, remember when we talked about inflation, we talked about these fluctuations inherent to space itself. The universe still has those. If you go down to the tiniest scales on the universe, the zero point energy of things, the rest state of empty space, it's not perfectly empty. There is some intrinsic non-zero energy to it. There is energy inherent to space itself. And if you consider that, that empty space itself has an energy. We don't know how to calculate it, but how would that show up? If you had an energy inherent to space itself, that is what Einstein called a cosmological constant. It's a different type of energy than all the others, and it can cause the universe to accelerate. How? Remember what happens to matter, right? Matter is just a whole bunch of particles. As the universe expands, as the volume of the universe expands, what happens to the matter density, right? Matter is just a collection of particles. It's just a bunch of stuff. If you expand the volume, but the mass stays the same, what happens to the density? It drops. And that's what we see happening in the universe. The matter density is dropping over time. What happens to the radiation density? It drops faster. Because not only is radiation getting sparser and sparser and sparser, the same way matter is, but it's also getting redshifted. It's also having its wavelength get stretched. So it's losing energy even faster. What happens to the density of space as the universe expands? What happens to the density of the empty space? Well, it's staying the same. Empty space is empty space is empty space is empty space. You don't lose space when the universe expands, you just make more of it. So its density stays the same. And we didn't know that it had a non-zero energy. We made an assumption that it should just all cancel out and be zero, but it isn't. And that's why now we live in a universe as of very recently, only the last few billion years, that's dominated by dark energy. That's dominated by energy intrinsic to space itself. And therefore, in a universe that isn't going to re-collapse, that isn't going to just expand forever and keep slowing down, but in a universe where things are getting progressively farther and farther and farther away. What's going to happen farther into the future? Will it continue to do that forever? Or will dark energy increase in density, leading to a big rip? Or will dark energy reverse itself in time and maybe someday still lead to a big crunch? We are going to launch a probe uh, probably not till next decade with the way the budget is going. But it is, was originally planned as SNAP. It is now called WFIRST. It was at some point in the middle of that called JDAM or the Joint Dark Energy Mission. And it is going to be able, it is going to measure these points in red compared to what we see today. In blue, in yellow and it will be able to tell us if we've got that right. It will be able to tell us, is dark energy really a constant? Is the universe just going to keep expanding and accelerating forever and ever? Or will it do one of these two unusual cases? So this is what we've learned since the original cosmos, and this is what we have to look forward to. We've learned when we look at the universe today, that big clusters of galaxies that are bound together will stay bound together. Little groups of galaxies bound together will stay bound together. Individual isolated galaxies will remain individual isolated galaxies. 
but everything that isn't already bound together will expand away at a faster and faster rate. In 100 billion years from now, what we look up at as the universe will just consist of our local group. The Milky Way, Andromeda, the Triangulum Galaxy, and about 40 other miniature dwarf galaxies. They'll eventually merge together, and that's it. In fact, here's an amazing fact. If we left home today, even at the speed of light, 97% of the galaxies that we can see today in our observable universe would be unreachable, even if we were able to travel arbitrarily close to the speed of light. And that brings us to the end, not of the universe, but of this talk. So the universe as we know it now is different in the beginning, is different today, and is different far into the future in its fate than it was just one generation ago in 1980. In the beginning, it didn't start from the Big Bang. Something happened before the Big Bang. You can't go back to an arbitrarily hot, dead state. Something set that up. It was cosmic inflation, a phase of empty space expanding exponentially, which set up and occurred before the Big Bang. Today, we know the universe is actually full of many different types of planets, gas giants, super big, including ones much bigger than Jupiter, including many that orbit very close to their parent stars. But it's also full of rocky, Earth-like planets, including some of which are in the habitable zones of their parent stars, and many of which may have life signatures on them. If they do have them, we're going to search them. It's possible if we get lucky, both in terms of telescope technology and what's out there, that we could find the first signs of life beyond our solar system in the next five to ten years, if everything breaks our way. And finally, the end of the universe has changed. Rather than having those three possibilities that we originally thought of, we found it's none of those. The universe will expand forever at an accelerating rate. Things will move away from us faster and faster and faster as time goes on. Distant clusters and distant galaxies will disappear from view first, but over time, even the closest big clusters of galaxies, like the massive Virgo cluster of galaxy, which contains more than a thousand galaxies bound together, and is only 50 to 60 million light years away, even that will eventually disappear from view. Eventually, all the galaxies beyond our local group will be lost to us forever. And on that uplifting note, thank you for your time. I would be more than happy to take whatever questions you have. Alan, I'll let you know this. Once again, my mind expands like the universe every time I listen to this man talk. We have a, a token of esteem, small compared to what you do for us every year. Thank you so much, Ethan. And I'd just like to remind you, we have to fly an Ethan from the West Coast. If you like to support things like this, please support the Center for Green. Please come to the front of our table. Heck, do what I tend to do. I earn these books. I'm going to try to get time to get that ice gas mom book. But if you beat me to it, I'm happy for you. And I will now take questions. Do you have some fun? If you have questions, please line up here. And within about 10 to 15 minutes, we'll be getting them ready for our keynote speaker, Mr. James E. Mason. Randy. So, yeah, uh, I remember um, reading on Stephen Hawking's one of the most recent books, and he said, um, asking what happened before the Big Bang is like asking what's north of the North Pole. So, I don't know, like, how do you kind of, since you were talking so much about before the Big Bang and how there's some innovation that decided to feel like. Uh, what exactly does talking mean, or how do you interpret that with respect to what you just expected? Okay, thank you. That is a good question. So, 
that statement, I have to put in context, that statement was made by Hawking before cosmic inflation was discovered. So he was under the assumption that when you say the Big Bang, you don't just mean a hot, dense, expanding state. You also mean a singularity, which is the beginning of space and the beginning of time. So when he says before the Big Bang, he is assuming that that is the moment that time began. Okay. So asking what happened before time, is sort of, that's what he means north of the North Pole. Like, no, that, like, saying before time, no, you can't have a before and time. Like, if time began, then there's no before. But if the Big Bang didn't go back to a singularity, if it doesn't go back to t equals zero, if it went back to a different state where time, which is in inflation, can be eternal to the past, then his objection has to be put into a different context. I hope that helps. Awesome. I don't really know how to phrase this as a question, but you sort of touched on it anyway, which is that this uh, accelerated expansion seems kind of sad. <laughs> Is that, that's the question. So, what, what emotional reaction do you have from this? I think would be a good way to put the question. So, what you're, what you're, what you're sort of getting at is, we're dreamers, we're explorers. We, are, we want to be travelers to the stars, to the galaxies. And what does it mean to say, hey, based on what we know now, even if we left at the speed of light, 97% of the galaxies that we see would be impossible to reach. Yeah, um, it's kind of a bummer to me too, but what I tend to look at when I want to look on the bright side of things is I do say, you know what, some of these things, and by some of these things, even 3%, we're still talking billions of galaxies are still within our reach if we leave now. The longer we wait, the more disappear. On a fun little time scale, um, we're losing about one galaxy every year. One galaxy every year is transitioning from we can reach it to we can't reach it. So I look at this as motivation. We need to get our space program in gear. We need to start exploring the universe while we still can. The sooner we get started, the more things we're going to be able to reach, the more things we're going to be able to find. The longer we wait, the more we're going to be confined to just our local group. So I use it as inspiration. Let's start today. Alright, I have a quick question on dark matter. How is dark matter measured? Okay, so I, I didn't talk about dark matter in this talk. Um, so we talked about dark energy, which is the energy intrinsic to space itself, and in my opinion is a terrible name, but we're stuck with it. Dark matter, all right, we have two types. We have what's called baryonic dark matter, which means dark matter that's made out of the same stuff we are. Dark matter that's made out of protons, neutrons, electrons, all the particles we find. That's about 15% of the dark matter. There's 85% of the dark matter, which is dark matter that's made up of stuff that we don't know what it is. It doesn't interact with light. Can I have a screen back for a moment? So when we look at the large scale structure in the universe, when we look at this simulation, Structure only forms in the patterns we see if we throw in the right mix of dark matter. We need dark matter to produce those exact spectrums of bumps in the map of the cosmic microwave background. We need dark matter to produce the right clustering properties that we have today. We need dark matter to make galaxies rotate at the speed we see them rotate. We know some of its properties. We know it has to be cold in temperature, meaning it couldn't have been moving too fast 
when it's structure formed. We know that it can't interact beyond a certain point with light, with normal matter, or itself. But as to what is dark matter, we're still actively researching that. Like Alan said during his talk, if science knew everything, it would stop here. So during Carl Sagan's time, we had some mysteries. Like, if you watch the original cosmos and you watch a simulation of a galaxy rotating, it's all wrong because it didn't have the right ingredients because dark matter was new. Dark matter really only became accepted during the 70s and 80s, like late 70s, mid 80s. So he didn't include it. It turned out it's better. It's a real problem. Now we know how galaxies rotate and why they don't wind up over time and why the arms don't get tighter. Dark matter has to do with that as well. So that's definitely a very important part of the story that I totally glossed over. Oh, I'm guilty there. Um, but as for what its nature is, we only have properties and constraints. We don't know what particle or set of particles are responsible for it. Really good question. Yes. Uh, since you've talked about other plans with life signatures, how possible do you think it is that they could be extraterrestrials on these planets could have contacted us or come to the Earth? I mean, here's the thing. If I were an alien, if I were on a very, very advanced planet, I wouldn't send out radio waves. I wouldn't look for radio waves. I would look for oxygen. There's only one way we know of to make a lot of oxygen in a planet that has inert gases like molecular nitrogen, like argon, like we have in our atmosphere. You make it through organic processes. Oxygen is a very volatile gas. If you brought oxygen to many of the worlds in our solar system, like Titan, like Saturn's moon Titan, oxygen would be fuel. You would just add a little heat, you would combine it with Saturn's atmosphere, and boom, oxygen is your fuel on that planet. So it's a very volatile reactive gas. If there's a civilization somewhere in our galaxy that has been around for a billion years, they would have known that there's life on Earth for a billion years. So I think the odds, if there's an alien civilization that they know about us, if they are at all more advanced than us, and by at all I mean a thousand years more advanced than us, they know about us. And I hope they're friendly. <laughs> Uh, yes, I read somewhere that uh, they said it was lucky that we live in a time period today with the technology we have, because if it would have been too much farther in the future with the expansion of the universe, we wouldn't have even been able to detect the uh, cosmic background radiation. So I guess my question is, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, we have the technology we have today, but we didn't get it till X amount in the future, where all we were able to really detect was our local cluster, um, how would that have changed cosmological science in the sense, could we still have even thought it would be banged, or that the other stuff was even out there because we couldn't see it or detect it? So as a note, we have about four minutes left, so no, no, I think this is probably the end of the line and I hope we'll, we'll get to every question. All right. I'm going to rephrase your question, if that's okay. Assuming we were born 100 billion years in the future, where there are no more galaxies beyond our own, where our local group is just everything merged together into one giant galaxy, and the cosmic microwave background, instead of being at 2.725 Kelvin with 411 photons per cubic centimeter, is now way colder in temperature and way more diffuse, how would we detect this? The answer is, we would have to go out on a limb and say, okay, I don't see any other galaxies in the universe, I don't see any background radiation in the microwave, but if the universe began from this hot, dense, expanding state, what would be left? And the answer now would be this incredibly diffuse, far, far radio radiation. We could build a ginormous radio telescope. 
a huge one that was honestly about the size of a moon. We can build a radio telescope the size of a moon. An antenna would work. We can build an antenna the size of a moon and say, I'm going to look at all directions in space and see if I can find this dis diffuse cosmic far radio background. And if we found it, we could then interpret that as, oh man, so the universe might not be just our galaxy in the middle of empty, empty, empty space. There might have been something from way long ago, and then they could measure its spectrum and learn about what was once the cosmic microwave background. I believe I am contractually obligated to picture that gigantic telescope array and say, that's no small moon. So what did the existence of the dark energy constant do to cool out the big freeze but still keep the big crunch as a possibility to the end of the universe? Um, you know, I, that's a really good question. So what I showed you about those possibilities, and let me bring that up again so that we can all take a look. Um, that was... This one. Yes, this one. Awesome. Okay, here's the thing. Big crunch without the acceleration would look like this. Big freeze would look like this. And it would just rise slowly and that would be the end of it. We're still going into a freeze. What's happening with the constant dark energy up there is we're going into that freeze faster than we would have under any other scenario. What we're saying is dark energy looks like its energy intrinsic to space itself. It looks, as we look at this graph, like it's this straight blue line. But you can see in the light blue shaded area here, there are uncertainties. So if dark energy actually follows something like this and gets stronger in the future, it will rip things apart that are bound together today. Galaxies, stars, solar systems, eventually molecules and atoms themselves will get ripped apart. That is the big rip. Or it could come down like this and get weaker and weaker and weaker over time and maybe even become negative. That would reverse the universe and cause a big crunch in the future. So that is how those different fates are still possible with dark energy. Only if dark energy is not a true constant. If it is, then we just get a big freeze real fast. That's the end of my answer. I want to, I'd rather get every question. Oh, real quick question. We talked about the beginning of the universe having a kind of cosmic inflation before the Big Bang. Could that be akin to something like a slow fuse and then going off like this? Or could you explain it differently? So what you're what I think you're asking is we had a period of cosmic inflation. It gave rise to the Big Bang. How? How did we go from cosmic inflation to the Big Bang? The answer is, I like to imagine that you've got a large amount of energy. I visualize it as sort of a, um, a floating peg ceiling. So you've got all these pegs interlocked, and it's just sort of like a level wall. And what happens? We're rolling along this wall. It's nice and smooth. It's, it's precarious, but we're OK. And then all of a sudden, there's like a little instability, and we fall through the floor, and it all falls apart. What happens is all that energy that's causing the universe to expand at this exponential rapid rate suddenly gets converted into matter and radiation. That is a process called reheating. It takes the universe from a zero temperature state that's rapidly expanding, inflating, and turns it into an energetic matter and radiation filled universe. 
So that's the visualization I use for it. I don't have a picture, I'm sorry. But that's, uh, but that's how I think of it. So rather than thinking of a fuse, because it is stored energy, but it doesn't explode, it's, it just gets transferred. All right, last question. If 97% of the universe is currently unreachable, at even at the speed of light, have you invalidated the entire premise of interstellar? Ah, so he's asking about wormholes. And wormholes are not necessarily the stuff of science fiction. So, if you can build yourself a black hole, and then in the center where the singularity would be, the throat of the black hole, you can put in some type of negative mass or negative energy to stabilize it and connect it to another black hole somewhere else in the universe, that would be the only way we know of currently to circumvent that and perhaps still reach these unreachable galaxies. This assumes that this one plausible solution to general relativity is relevant to our physical universe, which, to be honest and possibly crushing, may or may not be. So it is mathematically possible, whether it applies to our universe or not, we do not yet know. Okay? Thank you very much, dude. Mr. Anthony.